This is our call to worship. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear though as for that the passing there had worn them really about the same and both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black oh I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere, ages and ages hence, <coughs> two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Let us pray. And gracious and heavenly God, by your kindness, you have blessed us with a life. McCartney, and by your goodness, you have blessed us with a good life. And for that, we're here to bear witness to that life and to bear witness to a life everlasting vouchsafe for Jim. And we give thee thanks for that as well. Our prayers of consolation go family and friends. Our prayer of consolations go to the good people in Arkansas. Our prayer of consolations go to daughter and son and sister and wife and friends. Our prayers of consolation go to United Presbyterian Church. Amen and amen. Those able, please stand and we'll sing together all the verses of a mating grace, how sweet the sound. You'll find that on 280. <laughs>
please be seated. Some people will be driving by and they're going to see a lot of cars in the parking lot and they're going to wonder something's happening at United Presbyterian and what could it possibly be. Some people will be walking on their way to the mall and see cars and they'll say, why are there so many cars there? Something important must be happening. And something important is happening. Something very important is happening. Something so important that it has stopped the routine of many, many lives in this community. Something important that it has halted the way we carry out our routines. Something important so that in London, Right now, somebody's thinking about this, and somebody in the sky flying a plane is thinking about this right now. John Doan, I paraphrased him, said this. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Any man's death and diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. And therefore, never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. So there is a tolling of the bell that reminds us that what we're about is our own um, end also. And it is the end of a friend that reminds us about that. So we are gathered here together because something more powerful than all of us, and that's called death has brought us together, and there's nothing we can do about that. So great is the power of death. It changes, it alters, it harms, it destroys, it ends, and we're here. And yet there's something about being here in this sacred place where we bear uh, testimony to something more powerful than death, and that is life in Jesus Christ. That's why I'm here. I'm here because of life in Jesus Christ. And that's why the people in this fellowship are here. It's because of life in Jesus Christ. And death cannot be proud, for those who live in Jesus Christ will not die, but will live forever. Amen and amen. Alejandro? It is an honor for me to be reading the scripture for today. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we read your word, quiet our hearts and our minds so we can hear your voice. Amen. A reading from the book of Romans, chapter 14, verses 7 through 9. For none of us lives for himself alone, and none of us dies from himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. So for this reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living.
A reading from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. There is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What does the worker gain from his toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men. Yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Amen. continue now with the sharing of our memories and thoughts from relatives and friends.
The first candle represents our grief. The pain of losing you is intense. It reminds us of the depth of our love for you. The second candle represents our courage to confront our sorrow, to comfort each other, and to change our lives. The third candle we light in your memory for the times we laughed, the times we cried, the times we were angry with each other, the silly things you did, the caring and joy you gave us. This fourth candle, we light for our love. We light this candle that your light will always shine. As we enter this spring season and share this day of remembrance with our family and friends, we cherish the special place in our hearts that will always be reserved for you. We thank you for the gift of your living brought to each of us. We love you. We remember you. on behalf of uh, Jim's son, James McCartney. James remembers his dad. I have not yet had time to fully reflect upon my father in order to come up with a comprehensive narrative of my thoughts on his life, so here I will just tell you a few thoughts of him. <coughs> For some reason, when I think of all the time with my father, the image that comes to me first is when I was probably around five or six, walking along behind him along the canals, beside Andrew Air Park, west of Houston. Dad was carrying a fishing rod and a tackle box. I was walking along bursting the tufts of cattails and letting the seeds float away, or throwing pebbles into the water. Dad called them rice canals, but I also read that they were used to land seaplanes. It was also a very joyful, peaceful time where Dad and I were together with no worries and a whole day to enjoy. Dad was always playing tricks on us kids and on others' kids. He had LMNOs from the Crispy Critters commercial. He told us that when he uh, wrote that he wrote the songs that he sang, I'm looking over a four-leaf clover and please release me. He always told us that he was 18 years old, so we never knew how old he was. <laughs> he administered the knock of wisdom, a trick which mystified kids. When he called home and we answered, he said, this is the FBI. <laughs> we, he would get us to try to touch our tongues to our noses, which he could do. When Tambra would go, uh, go to school and innocently retell the tales Dad had told her, the teachers concluded that she was a liar. He teased us constantly and mercilessly, but it was always in good fun. When I went to college, my father used to call me every few days. It used to bug me. I was living on my own for the first time. Uh, my, uh, I was studying hard, but this question used to make me feel, excuse me, I was living on my own for the first time, trying to define myself independently from my parents. My father used to call and ask how my studying was going. I was studying hard, but this question used to make me feel stressed because I always knew there was more I could be doing. Later I realized that he was just trying to talk about any subject that we had in common just because he wanted to hear me. 
It was only much later, after I had my own son, that I finally understood the love Dad had for Tambra and me, because it was the same love I felt for my own son, a love I could not imagine having felt before. My dad had to call me like I will call my own son when he goes to college. <clears throat> now, I appreciate receiving those calls, and when I learned that he was ill, I tried to call every day in order to make the best of the time he had left and to pay back all those calls he made from the day I went to college until he became ill. It was strange coming back from Bloomington in February before I was still calling him every day. Now he is no longer there to call. I'm reading for Tambra, as she remembers her dad. <clears throat> My dad involved us in all his fun activities. We had motorcycles at a young age, so we could ride as he raced his. We went to the airport with him, both small airport and large ones. He made sure that we knew what he did, and he made sure we enjoyed it with him. At Andrew Airport, I remember having fun with the teletype machines and the ping pong tape. <clears throat> we sat at the end of the runway in the car, watching planes take off and land. I knew the Houston Intercontinental Airport better than the tour guides that led my elementary school class on tour. He would take us to the crew room and show us everything there. On our car trips, he would point out all the airports, the lights <laughs> at the airport, and what they meant. He recited checklists to us before we knew what they were. The seed was planted. Often people ask me why I wanted to become a pilot, and I often say I was brainwashed. <laughs> but the real reason was that I knew so much about it at such a young age because my dad shared that with me. When I turned 16, <coughs> dad sent me to the airport to learn to fly from one of his friends. Dad and I flew together at America West Airlines. He would call the night before our flight to make sure I packed spare clothes enough for the overnights. When we weren't flying together, we would see each other in the airport and he would always ask me if I had any money. Well, <laughs> not one to give up free money, I would always say, no, I don't have any money. And he'd hand me a $5 bill. Once in Flagstaff, Arizona, I was taking the plane he had flown in on and when he got off the plane he asked if I had any money and he gave me a five. So the next week when he got off the airplane my whole crew was there with their hands out for five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> we would often hear each other on the radio frequencies and say hi dad and he'd say hi Tambra. All the other pilots knew who it was but it often confused the air traffic controllers. <laughs> a few years after my dad retired I upgraded to captain. He still called to check on me. I'd be about to taxi out and I'd get a call asking how the weather was where I was going. Did I have enough fuel? <laughs> Did I have an alternate airport in my flight plan? Had I thought about this or that? Always a dad. Here I thought I had made it on my own, but realized it was still him making sure I was doing okay. He was always concerned with us making it on our own though. Always telling me to save my money. It seems to have sunk in over the years. I still find myself reaching for the phone to call him, to tell him the latest that is going on with my life or the airline. Only to remember he's not there. I do know what he would say, however, so it's comforting for me to feel his presence still. I'm approached every day I go to work by the pilots at my airline who tell me what a great guy he was and how much they enjoyed knowing and working with him. I have received lovely letters from many of them telling me how much he helped them in their careers or taught them something about flying. He won't soon be forgotten.
his friends and family here today, especially Virginia. I'm really honored to be a part of the celebration of Jim McCartney's life. Jim was my friend. I knew him as a humble, compassionate man who loved his family and loved every single minute he could spend in an airplane. As he put it, the cockpit of an airplane is the most comfortable place I can be. It is where I feel most at home. And at peace with God, the universe, and within. I've been blessed, and I did the one thing I wanted to do in my life, fly airplanes. That's the beginning of Jim's life story, as told in a book he wrote with his sister and only sibling, Angie Milo, during the last year of his life. My Life in Flight tells of Jim's career as an airline pilot, but also as a union negotiator, a corporate pilot, uh, an aviation instructor, a business entrepreneur, and much more. Jim and Virginia moved to Bloomington in 2007, and Colleen were very happy that they chose our neighborhood, St. James Woods, as their home. We were also very pleased that they chose United Presbyterian, this church, as their house of worship. It was after Jim was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in the summer of 2010, 10, that I, I believe was the time that he decided to write his story. He, together with his sister Angie, have done a magnificent job of illuminating a full, gratifying life. As I read it, I really wish I had known Jim earlier in his life and my life. If I had, I think I'd probably know how to fly an airplane. As it was, I was privileged to go up with him a couple of times, uh, once with an eight-year-old grandson, uh, who uh, Jim allowed to take the controls, and the little kid did very well. I, on the other hand, um, not so well. <laughs> Jim, fortunately, has a lot of patience, and I think he could have taught me. I knew Jim only for a few years of his life, and those years were the most intensely difficult and painful years of his life. I can't do justice to the totality of Jim's life, but I can share with you some aspects of, of his time, of his life, during the time I knew him. First thing about Jim McCartney that I want to mention to you is how he handled adversity, extreme adversity. It's said that still waters run deep, and I think of Jim that way, quiet, strong, determined. No one that I know could have handled the diagnosis of his cancer with more dignity than Jim did. When he found out uh, what he was up against, he had to make choices. If he thought there could be a reasonable quality of life, he would fight for that time. And he did just that. At the same time, he went to work on many arrangements, all the things one has to do at that time in one's life that would ultimately ease the burden for Virginia and his family. <clears throat> when adversity, extreme adversity strikes, as it did Jim, everything in life becomes immediate. No more business as usual. No planning the annual hunting trips. <coughs> no long-term commitments. The focus becomes immediate. <coughs> Treatment options, clinical trial possibilities, what doctors to see, what information is out there, how can it be accessed. Cancer is so diverse and biologically complex. Doing all of this really depends on advocacy. Who's there by your side to take care of the thousands of things that you really can't? Jim was blessed 
with a dedicated team of loving advocates, his wife Virginia, sister Angie, stepdaughter Connie, daughter Tambra. They researched, organized, prioritized thousands of pages of medical documents. In the book, My Life in Flight, Angie condensed the chronology of Jim's battle. <coughs> Only she, Virginia, and those that were close in the day in, day in and day out battled. These advocates know what tireless effort that it takes and was put forth doing all they could to extend his time here. And there were others. Two of Jim's church family were powerful advocates for him. Dr. Fadi Haddad, Dr. Suhail Haddad, both gave so generously of their time and their expertise to guide through Jim through each step of his complicated treatment process. And also beyond that to provide their loving friendship and moral support. As Jim's friend and neighbor, I tried my best when I made my visits to him to make him laugh a little bit. I do believe that laughter and humor is therapeutic. As things worked out, most of the time, it was Jim who made me laugh. <laughs> One day he told me about a little red-haired, freckle-faced kid about five years, five or six years old who boarded a flight of his in Lafayette, Louisiana. And as Jim usually did with kids, he'd bring them up to the cockpit when time allowed, show them around, show them how the instruments work, put them in the seat. And as he was doing this, he said to the boy, I guess they call you Red, huh? And the kid said, yep, they call me Red. Later in the conversation, Jim said to the kid, Well, Red, are you married? Red <laughs> replies, What the hell's the matter with you, man? Are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> Silly things. But there were a lot of serious things that happened too up there, 30,000, 40,000 feet. Jim knew he had people around him who loved him and were there for him. And were doing all they could for him. But advocacy is essentially earthbound. What changed Jim's perspective, I believe, is his calling out to his God. And the transformation that came about when his God answered. As romantic and poetic as Jim could be about flying airplanes, Jim, as I knew him, was a realistic and pragmatic person as well in other aspects of his life. In late August of 2010, at that time when Jim was wrestling with the decision about whether or not to begin chemotherapy, Reverend Bremer, who by the way also is a wonderful advocate for Jim, acknowledged in a Sunday sermon, or excuse me, included a special message in his Sunday ser sermon for Jim. Jim stood up that day and acknowledged that he had prayed to God for strength and reassurance and that his prayer had been answered. There is a peace that transcends understanding, and those close to Jim could sense that peace growing in him even as his body physically grew weaker. Jim was moving closer and closer to the final chapter in my flight in life. But before that, there'd be a reunion with a group of his longtime flying buddies in Houston, a visit with his son James, Sophie, grandson Julian. A special event for Colleen and I it was a brilliant fall day last October when, together with Jim, Virginia, Angie, we drove to the old store inn for a lunch and to celebrate Jim's birthday. It's a day to remember for us. And today as well, it's a day to remember as we celebrate Jim's life with the understanding that he really had no fear of death, only curiosity about the next great adventure. He was proud of the life he lived, his accomplishments, Sad to leave Virginia, and sad that he couldn't see 
his beloved grandchildren, Claire, Caroline, and Julian, grow into adulthood. But he left surrounded by our love. I'd like to end with a, a brief reading. Uh, I don't know, the, the author is anonymous, but I've always liked it. And it's always meant something to me. And I'd like to dedicate it to Virginia. It's called Togetherness. Death is nothing at all. I've only slipped away into the next room. Whatever we were to each other, we still are. Call me by my old familiar name. Speak to me in the same easy way you always have. Laugh as we always have. Laugh at the little jokes we enjoy together. Play, smile, think of me, pray for me. Life means all that it has ever meant. It is the same as it always was. There is absolute unbroken continuity. Why should be out, I be out of your mind because I'm out of your sight? I'm just waiting for you for an interval, somewhere very near, just around the corner. All is well. Nothing has passed. Nothing has been lost. One brief moment, and all will be as it was before, only better, infinitely happier. We will be one together forever. I was struck with, although I shouldn't be surprised, I was struck with the with, with how much um, I don't want to say that my eulogy is redundant, but certainly echoes what everybody has said, and and that says volumes about who Jim is, frankly. And, and so <clears throat> I want to thank everyone for all that they've said, and I. I, I, I'm really aware of, of, of uh, much of what was said. I appreciate that. However many years ago, Colleen and John Swanson Invited into the Fellowship of United Presbyterian Church, two old time social Southern Democrats. <laughs> the Swansons are not Democrats. <laughs> They're Christians. And that's why they invited. Uh, Jim and Virginia McCarthy, also devout Christians, to join this odd assembly, this collection of uh, disparate kinds of people who somehow get along. And that's significant. Little did the Swansons or the McCarthy Cartneys know that so soon we would be gathered to mourn the passing of Jim and also at that same time to celebrate his life. This is not what we planned on. <sighs> I think
think everyone here has seen Jim's obituary. It's worth your attention as it lifts up his accomplishments. They are noteworthy. They have much to do with his to do with his carriage as a pilot. And it all makes for good reading. And it's all accurate and certainly inspirational. And it's resplendent and even redolent with metaphor about what it means to be a pilot and how glorious that is. But down to earth, this is what really matters. For if one's feet are not on the ground while one's head is in the skies, it's a foolhardy venture, this being human, and nothing but a fantasy. So as I review the life and times and legacy of Jim, I am more inclined to praise Jim for his life on earth as a father to James and Tambra they bear the carriage of their father as evidence in their lives so I am more inclined to praise Jim for his life as a brother, a brother to Angela, and she and her notable contributions to the elevation of, and they are notable contributions to the elevation of humankind. And they bear these accomplishments, the carriage of a brother. So I am more inclined to speak of Jim's marriage to his beloved Virginia, beautiful, stalwart. And she speaks of Jim's carriage as a husband. You see, I am more inclined to speak of Jim's relationship to his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because this sings of his carriage of a man of faith. In many regards, contrary to popular belief, um, James Franklin McCartney was fortunate to know of his impending death. I would wish that for everyone. And a death announced by an old friend of mine, uh, Dr. Mark Dayton, 18 months ago or so. For it gave Jim time to show his sister, to show his children, to show his wife, to show his church, to show the grandchildren and all the step-grandchildren and children, this constellation of, of people who loved him, to show them how to die, how to live in the face of death and how to die. and how to die in the face of life. That's something. That's a gift. And in doing so, how to be dignified, be their sorrow and be their pain, and yet, in all of this, in spite of all affliction, to live and to live with honor. Concerning his impending death, Jim took the road, less, the road less traveled. A road of darkness he chose. A road of uncertainty he chose. A road of pain he accepted. And in doing so, he stood down death, and now he stands with Jesus.
And this is the courage of a man and the carriage of a human being. This is the carriage of a man of God, one we know as Jim McCartney. Oh, I have slipped, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings. Sunward I have climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of. Wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silent. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up and up and up the long delirious burning Blue, I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace. Where never lark or even eagle flew, and while with silent, lifting mind I have trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand. I have put out my hand and touched the face of God. Ah. He will be missed. So, I charge you, those who are friends of the family, that in the name of Jesus Christ, that you would follow this man with dignity, that you would take what he has been about and uh, make it part of your life and make it part of your heart, that when your time comes, you will not complain about the lot that has been cast before you, that when it comes your time, you will not complain, but rather you will take a road less traveled, and the road that you will take will be one of affection, be one of honor, be one of dignity. I charge you in the name of Jesus Christ to do just that. And to the family, and I charge you this in the name of Jesus Christ. You will not forget this, and you are not to forget it. You are to remember it forever. And in time what will happen is the sharpness of the sadness of this, this loss will go away. And it will be, pray, be replaced with a sober joy. And I wish that for you. You see, every person's death diminishes us. And we are diminished. Don't forget that. Now, for those who are still able to sing like a, a meadow lark, and those that can't but can still sing, um, please play this through for us once, and then uh, we will share it again. And Sue, would you come up and help sing this with us so we can come in on time? <coughs>
that we are here today. We give thee thanks that there was a life that was rich and filled with wonder and goodness. And because we have been touched by that life, we have gathered. For had we not known the sorrow of the loss of that life and the love that we all enjoyed, we would not be here and this life would have been wasted. But it was not wasted. We give thee thanks for the gift of James Franklin McCartney. And we give thee thanks that we were gifted by him. And so, may the blessings of Jesus Christ, who is indeed Lord and Savior, rest upon every single person here and beyond, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.